in our last few sessions we discussed line by line brahma sutras and where possible i gave a psychoanalytic commentary brahma sutras tries to synthesize the seeming contradictions in the upanishads in my view however it falls short of its objective it achieves a lot but even as it achieves a lot it falls short of the objective and it is not very difficult to achieve that objective and therefore i have put together this session which is a consolidated session a consolidated session on the whole of brahma sutras a brahma sutras till now we have been going chapter by chapter line by line today we will go consolidated commenting on the whole of brahma sutras and as we do it contribute towards achieving the objective of brahma sutras which is reconciliation and synthesis of upanishads even as we do so we will address from a psychoanalytic standpoint what can be learnings from the brahma sutras and what psychoanalysis can contribute to spiritual schools and brahma sutras lastly how is it important for us for present and future so with this background let us go into this consolidated session psychoanalysis in indian tradition in that series we are on brahma sutras having seen it chapter by chapter line by line now we do a consolidated session upon the whole of brahma sutras from psychoanalytic standpoint where possible from pure philosophical and spiritual standpoint otherwise and the goal of the brahma sutras is reconciliation of spiritual texts especially upanishads and a synthesis of them let us get into the discussion first what is the objective of brahma sutras the primary objective is establishment of a spirituality which is based upon pluralism harmony truth and personal experience and this is the goal of all spiritual schools in india this goal is shared by the whole of hindu spirituality there are many ways of contributing to this goal brahma sutra tries to contribute to this goal by a synthesis by avoiding unnecessary clashes and fights by avoiding confusion and unnecessary contradictions and this the brahma sutra does by attempting the synthesis of those parts of upanishads where there seems to be a contradiction lack of clarification or a need for a higher synthesis so how does brahma sutras go into the synthesis of seemingly different opinions which we find scattered in so many upanishads especially the 11 main upanishads and some contradictions in other upanishads 
Brahma Sutras attempts this synthesis by getting into these engagements. Brahma Sutras gets into clarification where necessary. It takes up a line from a particular Upanishad and where Vyasa feels, sage Vyasa feels, that it is not being correctly understood, he clarifies it. And also cites support from Shrutis, primarily the Vedas. So clarification is one very important element that Brahma Sutras does. Pick up a statement which is controversial or wrongly understood or not understood or not paid emphasis to and clarify what it means so that the statement can achieve its true objective. Second activity Brahma Sutra does is by resolving contradictions. When one line in one Upanishad and another line in another Upanishad, they seem to be contradictory. Brahma Sutras resolves the contradiction by bringing to light what is the meaning of X and what is the meaning of Y and saying the meaning is not very different or the meanings are complementary. They are not contradicting to each other. So resolving contradictions. Third, Brahma Sutra repudiates wrong arguments. If in any Upanishad any statement is found which seems to be blatantly wrong, Brahma Sutra takes up the challenge of saying it so. And this happens often because of contamination by insertion, which has happened over centuries, wherever original texts have been tempered with. And you find insertions, and these insertions are not enriching insertions, they are contaminating insertions. So, Brahma Sutras, in that sense, purifies the contamination or tries to purify the contamination by proving the contamination to be worthless and out of place, although it was not able to ask anyone to remove this particular statement from the Upanishad. And this purification of spiritual texts is necessary not only in Hinduism, but all religions. When we read any spiritual text, including Brahma Sutras, it is very easy to find that certain statements have been inserted. One, because there is a sudden change of subject. Something just appears out of nowhere. There is no continuity of the subject. Two, the level of the argument. You are discussing something at a profound depth. For five sutras, ten sutras, suddenly you have a very petty, very ordinary, very banal kind of a sutra. And it's very clear that somebody who has written the first twelve sutras cannot write the next one. And the next one is so uh, non-profound that it does not even merit a place in such a profound document. So Brahma Sutra repudiates those arguments, but falls short of asking for removal of those arguments <clears throat> from the spiritual texts. Brahma Sutra also tries for removal of effect of inserted contamination, but it cannot, it is still falls short of asking anyone for removing the contamination itself. Brahma Sutra also brings to the light of center stage, or should I say, brings to light and center stage, the state of enlightenment, which is the goal of all spiritual 
practices and all religions. And the state of enlightenment, I should correct myself, the state of enlightenment is the goal of all spiritual schools, not necessarily of all religions. Different Upanishads and different spiritual schools, different philosophical schools in the Hindu tradition, they have given a different description of the state of enlightenment. And this is the goal of the spiritual school. So the Jain school has a different description of the state of enlightenment, Kevalyam. The Buddhist school has a different expression, description of the state of enlightenment it calls Nirvana. The Advait school of Shankaracharya has a different description of the state of enlightenment which it calls merger with the Brahman. Some spiritual schools talk of the state of no thought as the state of enlightenment. Patanjali in Yoga Sutras describes variety of states that are described as states of enlightenment by various schools. On that point, Patanjali is very open, very holistic, very inclusive. And that's how it should be. And we should expand on those lines. Brahma Sutras points towards the Advaita Vedanta description of enlightenment. of union with the Brahma, experience of oceanic oneness with existence. And the oceanic oneness of Advaita Vedanta in experience is not different from Sri Aurobindo's experience of it. But in terms of philosophy, it is different. We will see how it is different, the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta in terms of description of Brahma from Sri Aurobindo's description of reality. On that point, Brahma Sutra is not open and inclusive. It is insistent on one particular experience as being the experience of enlightenment. On that point, my feeling is we need more of pluralism. Brahma Sutras also describes the path towards the goal. And occasionally it tries to implicitly synthesize at times even explicitly synthesize some paths and prove validity of those paths based upon authority of Shrutis, the scriptures, revealed scriptures. And by doing all this, tries to achieve a reconciliation, clarification and synthesis of Upanishads. To prove at the end validity of all Upanishads, validity of all paths given in the Upanishads, validity of all processes and statements given in the Upanishads, except for a few. Those few where the point is of 
something being patently wrong or a question of inserted contamination and most of the times the two are the same. Something is wrong because it is inserted. It has not come from the original source. So this objective of Brahma Sutra to reconcile appearing differences in statements of various Upanishads prove that they are not at the depth of it contradictory separate those with substance from those without it and create a synthesis and an open spiritual arena an open spiritual space and ensure a harmony among spiritual texts, spiritual paths and spiritual seekers. Brahma Sutra achieves these objectives to a substantial degree. But it falls short of expectations of those who expect a much deeper synthesis and a much deeper integration of Upanishads and far more profound argumentation based upon spiritual experiences, of course, from the Brahma Sutras. So Brahma Sutra substantially achieves its goals, achieves its goals, but falls short of expectations of many who have very profound expectations from the Brahma Sutras. So the question is, how to achieve the objectives of Brahma Sutras better than how Brahma Sutra tries to achieve those objectives. And if we want to achieve those objectives better, on what points do we need to engage with, elaborate upon, in what way? So the objective is attained. One way to do it is what I will be discussing today. There can be other ways, of course, better ways perhaps. One way, however, what I feel can achieve objectives of Brahma Sutras much better And while doing so, being profound, deep, consistent, open, and not having to resort to the authority of Shruti for any argument whatsoever, one can find secondary support, one can establish congruence. One can have intuitive assurance, even feel reverence preserved, but for while the argument is going on, I personally feel it's better not to evoke infallible authority of the Shrutis while the argument is going on. So with this background, let us get into the consolidated discussion on how objectives of Brahma Sutras can be achieved better creating 
profound philosophical and spiritual structure. So first, let us go into where the Brahma Sutra falls short. That is not to say it does not achieve much. It is an iconic book. <clears throat> it's a part of Prasthantrai. Revered, respected, all of that rightly so. But it does fall short in my view. And where it falls short in my view is because of these reasons. Much of Brahma Sutras, I feel, is devoted more to repudiation rather than synthesis. Second, occasionally it becomes self-righteous. Third, there is a wholesale rejection of Sankhya and Yoga Sutras, which I feel is incorrect. Sankhya and Yoga Sutras are very valuable, very precious, and there is truth into them. In fact, Yoga Sutras is one of the most open and inclusive books. And I personally find if I have to compare Yoga Sutras and Brahma Sutras, I find Yoga Sutras to be better than Brahma Sutras. Which should not have been so, but it is so. Brahma Sutras also fall short where it appeals to the authority of the Shruti for proving an argument. We have to grant that we are talking of rare experiences. And because Shrutis are written by those who have rare experiences in revelation, not even by their own ordinary consciousness. Authority of Shrutis has a special place, no doubt about it. But to go to Shrutis authority for proving every argument, I think that is not, at least to my taste, it is not to my taste. And this Brahma Sutra does too often. You take up a statement from an Upanishad, you don't agree with it. You say it is wrong because it is so written in the Shrutis. So the contest of an argument is not on merit of the argument or merit of a contrary argument which is better than the given argument. The repudiation of an argument is done by appeal to the authority of a Shruti, which I think is not necessary at all. And I think of this as a shortcoming of Brahma Sutra. The level at which Brahma Sutra goes is a very wide range. You seem to go at a profound depth and suddenly you find something very petty. It can be a statement, it can be an analogy, it can be a kind of repudiation, it can be support to some statement, but you suddenly find switching of gears from profound to petty. This is where the whole idea of, the whole problem of contamination by insertion also comes in. Analogies used in Brahma Sutras are often very weak and inexact. If you deconstruct them, you can easily tear apart that analogy and the argument it's trying to forward or support. This weak argumentation by analogy. Brahma Sutras is not as open as plural as the Yoga Sutras is. Pluralism is inadequate. On two particular points we can see this.
pluralism is inadequate across the whole of Brahma Sutra by and large. Especially on two points, we can see it most explicit. One, in describing the goal state of enlightenment. And two, describing paths towards enlightenment. Patanjali in Yoga Sutras is quite plural on this, quite inclusive and open. He describes a variety of states of enlightenment. Variety of goal states which are termed as enlightenment by various schools in Indian in Hindu spirituality. And variety of paths to enlightenment, which a variety of Hindu spiritual schools follow. Pluralism is inadequate in Brahma Sutras. The goal state of enlightenment he talks about is only one state of oceanic experience of oceanic oneness in the Brahma. Oneness with existence. It does not talk about the state of Nirvana or a state of Kaivalya as the Jains would describe it very differently from the way the Classical literature describes Kevalya. Central reservation I have about Brahma Sutra is this. I expected it to come up with a comprehensive, deeper, elemental meta theory which would synthesize all Upanishads, and Brahma Sutra does not do anything of that type. Because this comprehensive deeper theory did not be empirical, it can be essential, it can be conceptual. It could be an essential psychophilosophical theory, doesn't have to be a scientific empirical theory. Brahma Sutra doesn't do this and on this point particularly I think, this is my central reservation. So when I say Brahma Sutra falls short, it falls short on many points, but 75% of its falling short is on this point. When you try to synthesize Upanishads, best way to do it is to have a comprehensive, deeper, if possible, elemental, if not possible, at least a essential conceptual meta theory which synthesizes all Upanishads. Brahma Sutra doesn't do it. I have created the heat approach, holistic elemental analysis and therapy approach, where there is a comprehensive essential theory of course, not empirical theory. And that approach could be used to attempt a conceptual synthesis of Upanishads. Once we have seen where it falls short, let us go into how we can make good where Brahma Sutra falls short. So if we want to make a good where Brahma Sutra falls short, what is the resolution? How can we synthesize and achieve that objective which Brahma Sutra wants to achieve but falls short? We can have an, a synthesis, a resolution by addressing these points. First, the aspect of philosophy. How do we see the fundamental structure and emergence of reality? Two, what is the goal state of enlightenment? How do you describe it? And if there are many states of enlightenment or many states 
termed as states of enlightenment, then what are those states? Three, what are the paths to the states of enlightenment that we have described in point two? Fourth, how do we address and understand the mystical statements put up in Upanishads when somebody is in the mystical state and the statements you make in those mystical states are poetic statements true in a particular context and they are not necessarily absolute truths or something that can stand to the scrutiny of every context if we try to apply them as relevant to every context. Then an engagement with arguments in various Upanishads based on their own merit and in the light of pluralism. Overcoming this whole process of contemplation and deliberation by use of very weak analogies. Let us put aside the analogies. And analyze without analogies. And lastly, how do we look at the synthesis of the Upanishads as relevant to the present and future? If we address these points, and reflect upon them, elaborate upon them in a convincing way, open, inclusive, comprehensive way, of course, essential way, not empirical way. We can achieve the synthesis Brahma Sutra wants to achieve and make good the shortcomings of Brahma Sutras. So let us go into addressing each of these areas and see how everything falls into place. How contradictions can be resolved. Half said things can be completed to closure in explicit elaboration. Acceptance of plural paths to enlightenment can be harmonized. Subjectivity can be harmonized with objectivity. Subjectivity of the individual with objectivity of the universe. How we can start from the moment of creation and come to human history and from there to the search of enlightenment of an individual and how can one live after one has had the experience of enlightenment. Let us enter into that reflection and contemplation. First, how do we go from the moment of creation of the universe the most generic event possible to the most specific event possible in this world where a human integer starts having a desire for enlightenment. From the universal Big Bang to the spiritual Big Bang in the individual.
philosophy, the first area of reflection. When we look at philosophy, what are the schools we find in the Hindu spiritual tradition? We find seven approaches. First, approach that there is no God, it's only nature. And there is no question there, even of the evolution of soul. This essentially is the Charvaka approach. The Indian materialists, the Indian hedonists, the Indian agnostics, the Indian individualists, but they are very different from the Western counterparts because they are into this in a very profound way. It is not a teenager's, it's my life kind of a screen. It's a very profound philosophy which balances both individualism and collectivism tries to bring about some sustainability in society, even when hedonistic. So one approach is approach of pure nature, nothing but nature, no soul, no evolution, no God. The Charvaka philosophy and some schools associated on those lines with Charvaka philosophy. Second school of philosophy in the Hindu tradition are those schools which believe there is no God but there is evolution of the soul. These are the Jain schools, the Buddhist schools and some of the Sankhya schools. <clears throat> Here there is no God but there is a soul and the soul is in evolution. So there is the law of karma, there is a soul, there is a law of karma and there is enlightenment and liberation and freedom. Western civilization finds it very difficult to accept there can be a spiritual school without God. This is a unique thing in Hindu spirituality. You have a spiritual school with its own scriptures, its own gurus, its own rishis, its own liberated people, its own followers, its own practices, its own culture, its own mythology. But these are schools that believe in the soul and evolution of the soul and enlightenment but not in God. So second group of spiritual schools. No God, but soul, yes, karma, yes, enlightenment, yes, sadhana, yes. Third group of philosophical schools in India, they believe in God and nature. some of the Vaisheshika schools. I hope I am not confusing the Vaisheshika school. I believe their atom is also I'll correct it if I go wrong, but the point is there is a third group of schools where the idea is, I think it is the Vaisheshika school, there is God and there is nature. And both of them 
they exist forever but nature is not in control of god it has its own laws and god also has its own power but not complete control over nature so this is the third group of school so this third group of hindu spiritual schools and they also believe in soul they also believe in evolution they also believe in enlightenment then we have the fourth group the dwait school or the duality schools where they say god exists the soul exists and nature exists and nature and soul both have come out of god but they are never going to be one again they are always going to be different so there is soul immersed in nature and the soul after some experiences starts having the desire for enlightenment starts treading on the spiritual path becomes liberated and goes back to god but there is god and there is this liberated soul they remain together but they never become one there is the god and the liberated soul so the duality is perpetual the dwait schools uh, one very popular dwait school is that of iskon most of you would have heard iskon international society for krishna consciousness they belong to the dwait school and then there are hybrid models of vishesh dwait specialized dwait qualified dwait so it's a group of schools the fifth is the advait one of adi shankaracharya which says there is one brahma and everything has come out of it and everything will merge back to it and enlightenment is the soul merging with brahma which is not allowed in dwait it's allowed in advait so the goals are different in both cases the soul by sadhana overcomes karma overcomes desires and fears frees itself but the state of freedom is different described differently and they believe it is different it's not only that description is different they genuinely believe it is so what they describe is the truth in advait the talk is only of one brahma there is no talk of multiple universes so there is brahma which is the ground of all from which everything emerges and this is a universal brahma but there is no transcendent a part of it we may not know but the reality has exhausted itself in this so even if there is unknowable it is in this brahma there is no idea of multiple brahmas then we come to shri arbindo's philosophy of integral yoga and there the idea is that there is a reality or god and that reality creates one universe which has one brahma from which everything proceeds which creates the laws but this reality even as it creates this universe this brahma which in turn creates the universe this reality is not exhausted it can create many such universes and still it is not exhausted so this reality is transcendent to all manifestation the manifestation is grounded in brahma this reality creates brahma then brahma creates all the manifestation but this reality is not exhausted even as it creates the ground for manifestation of so many universes so here in shervindo's philosophy the spiritual experiences have a very different flavor shervindo describes four 
spiritual experiences. First, the state of no thought. Second, feeling the psychic in the center of the chest. Third, universal oneness as Shankara talks about. And fourth, between the ground and the mind, there are layers of consciousness which we have to ascend to experience and then bring them down into our everyday life so that it becomes a new normal, what he calls transformation, the supramental transformation. So this is very inclusive of many of points of other schools and in some cases it opposes some of the schools like Ved. And then there is a question of whatever philosophy, whatever school we believe in, how does that emergence of universe, that fundamental structure and emergence of universe relate to the history on earth? How is this philosophy related to history? Is history just the creation of what human beings do and its consequences? Is history just human free will and the laws of nature? Or is there a program for the planet which flows from the program of the universe? And therefore there would be a connection between the philosophy we believe in and the history that we see on the planet. And this history will inevitably lead us to a destination which is destined by this philosophy. And if we believe so, then how do we use this philosophy to interpret our history, understand it and prepare for present and future? So this would be the linkage from the philosophy to history. So there the idea would be, as Sri Aurobindo says, there is free will and there is determinism. It's not either or. The broad journey of the earth is fixed. Human will can slightly change it. Not only slightly, substantially change it, but the large movements are determined. They are suprahuman determined. And this does not seem to be unbelievable because we see the, the concept of design in existence everywhere. And this design obviously is not a human created design. It's a suprahuman design, design at every level. Design of the food chain, design of the human body, design of the laws of nature, design of ecological systems design of galaxies. There is a design at work so apparent and obviously it's not a human creation. It's a suprahuman design. Science is only understanding the design. It's not actually creating the design. The design is at work even if we don't understand it. So one way to look at this movement from philosophy to history to individual search for enlightenment can be paraphrased in this way. That there is a reality, God, from there emanates without exhausting it a principle and the principle is potent with the journey of the universe it's going to create. It has freedom, power, and there is grace at work in the principle. This principle of the universe in turn creates laws and the laws apply to all creation, maintenance, destruction. The fundamentality of this 
trinity and the laws residing at the heart and managing all substances and forces and after creating the laws the principal uses the principal uses its freedom and power to first create laws and after creating laws it creates constructional elementals forces energies all the entities which are at in process in the universe after the laws are created elementals are created and once the two are in place processes start and substances get built universe comes into existence on earth we see the history of matter life mind and then we see human history and in this human history an individual finds himself in a context and the individual after undergoing adequate experiences according to his program of life starts having a desire for enlightenment he starts developing interest in philosophy in spirituality in mysticism and this is a very central moment for the individual a celestial moment brahma sutra talks about this moment with a statement athato brahma jignyasa that now the curiosity which will not not be quenched it's not a fleeting curiosity it's not a temporal curiosity it is a here to stay forever curiosity till it is satisfied the buddha used to talk about a concept of trishna the trishna of desire the thirst which cannot be quenched this is a positive counterpart of it the positive thirst for enlightenment and once it happens one searches for path one tries many paths and then follows one or does a mix and match and creates one's own path one's own basket of practices one's own basket of beliefs what convinces what gives happiness and what works and from there subjectivity starts one chooses one's own definition of enlightenment and one chooses one's path towards it and the definition of enlightenment and the path towards it may be taken completely from any particular school or you can do individually a mix and match most people take the goal of enlightenment from what particular school but most people also do mix and match in the path there are of course group a group there is also of course a group of people who takes both enlightenment and the path from any one particular school and some who navigate more than one schools who are more eclectic and if one gets into enlightenment and that means any of the rare experiences that we call as enlightenment experiences after that what happens what is the life post enlightenment and there is a continuum there is after enlightenment some people go the way of the avadhut which we'll talk about in a few moments complete withdrawal no engagement with the world minimum engagement just to preserve the body at times even not that engagement 
and the second extreme is the person after enlightenment without attachment is completely immersed in the affairs of the world for the good of society. So we have this Audhut position and we have this Krishna position. The Krishna position is post enlightenment, complete involvement in the world without entanglement. And the Avdhut position is no involvement at all, not even like a Buddha going out to preach. And in between are all the hybrid stations which can be taken up by an individual post enlightenment. So this is how the philosophy slowly moves to a situation where an individual starts having a spiritual desire and the specificity of the individual gets linked to the broad philosophy. So if we go this way, many of the things fall in place. And we don't have to fall short as it happens in Brahma Sutra in some areas. We continue with the philosophy. We said this is how we, if we choose any of these schools, and we say this is how in a fundamental sense, reality, reality emerges. And this is how reality moves into existence down to the specificity of an individual and his quest for enlightenment. In the same context then, how is any event caused? What is an essential causality force field? behind any event. So from that standpoint, the conceptual model leads us to 11 causes which are behind any event. Not necessary all of them will act to cause an event. Maybe one of them will, maybe a couple of them will, maybe all of them will. So whether an event will happen or not is a contest of forces and the force field essentially is constituted of these 11 forces at work. We are in a situation of over-determinism. It's neither mono-determinism nor multi-determinism, it's a over-determinism. Not only all of them can together cause an event, each of them individually can also cause an event. Situation of overdetermination. So, what are these constituents in the causal force field behind any event? First, an event can be caused just by the laws of nature. Apple has to fall down it will fall down by gravity. Or an event can happen by the will of man. Apple which has fallen down, somebody can pick it up and throw it at somebody. Or it can happen because of the free will of others. Somebody can say, lift up that apple and give it to me. Or it can happen because of karma of man. The past life's karmas can lead to certain events. You work hard, but you don't get success. Or because of karma of others. You are with somebody who is destined not to success and he pulls you down. Or because of your own self journey. Your soul wants to have certain experiences and therefore will not allow you to be stable in one particular job. Every five, ten years you will have a change of area, complete area, not only a job, even a complete sector, because the soul wants 
to experience many sectors. It does not want you to become an expert in one sector and reach the top. So then you are constantly in a exploratory experiential learning mode. Journey of others. Somebody's journey is to live in a low-income environment. And if you live with them, you will never be able to pull them up and take them to a high-income environment. Journey of the universe. The universe has some plan in mind. Let us take the cultural context. Sri talks about the historical evolution of cultures as the tribal culture the traditional family culture, the individualistic culture, and the spiritual culture. And the individual first passes through them, and the most advanced individuals, they pass through them the first, and then the society follows. So as you, so society makes a transition from a traditional culture to an individualistic culture. Even if you don't want it to happen, you cannot stop it because suprahuman forces are at work. Spirit of the age, as it is called. Beyond the control of individuals, efforts or will. Grace. Grace can happen straight from reality through the principle or directly from the principle because reality is not different from the principle. So grace can happen from principle, from higher beings, or straight from reality itself. And that can change, accelerate or deaccelerate the course of events at a very fundamental level. And this grace is supposed to be one of the reasons, along with the program of the journey of universe, which determines when life will begin or mind will make an advent. Higher beings who are liberated or who have been created as higher beings by the principle, their will and their power and their grace can also affect causality of events. And then there is chance at play. God loves to play dice, just as God loves to play by law. God plays dice rarely. By law, he plays most of the times. But chance is one more element. And these 11 entities together they create a force field for causality of any event. When we put it into spiritual events, psychological events, Brahma Sutra talks about, when we apply this, most of the difficulties go away and we are able to harmonize much better the seeming contradictions. We now come to the state of enlightenment and if we accept subjectivity and pluralism and respect different states referred to as states of enlightenment by different schools of Hindu spirituality and we don't insist that only one state is valid and others are invalid or inferior or intermediate. Openness, inclusiveness and pluralism will set to rest seeming contradictions and create a pluralistic harmony among Upanishads. So what are the different states that are referred to as states of enlightenment by different schools? 
first the state of stillness there is stillness in the mind but we don't find there is no thought but we don't find bliss this is a state of stillness no thought but no bliss there is a state of no thought with bliss and high awareness there is a state of dissolving into nothingness where one experiences nothingness and all negating absolute one can experience pure consciousness without thought even without bliss not with the flavor of nirvana but as pure awareness pure consciousness the kevalya state one can experience the psychic in the center of the heart chest sorry or one can experience oneness with existence and all these have been stated to be the states of enlightenment these may be goal states to different spiritual schools in some schools like shri arbindo's school of integral yoga there is a hierarchy of experiences so first a state of no thought then psychic then oneness with existence and then bringing down the higher states of mind into our everyday existence creating a supramental transformation plurality of path of enlightenment if we accept various states of enlightenment and if we accept with openness inclusion and pluralism equally valid various paths to enlightenment mother says it very well she says each sadhak has his own way of sadhana each creates his own path and his own basket of beliefs tools and techniques so from that standpoint if we accept it with openness and plurality harmony is ensured established across seeming differences in upanishads so path to enlightenment there is a path of knowledge emotion and action sanskrit terms are well known, well known. gnana yoga bhakti yoga and karma yoga there is a path of kriya yoga working on the energies and breath integral yoga of shri arbindo ashtang yoga of patanjali a very elaborate system of tantra which is a world of it by itself which includes use of mantra use of rituals use of visualization experiences even substances one more path of energy healing system like reiki pranic healing tai chi there will be very more energy healing systems that i don't know of the path of meditation individual meditation or social meditation passive meditation or active meditation use of mantra visualizations and substances and rituals one substance soma is described in vedas very important use of substances for self development the research has started again after the moratorium 
hopefully hopefully the use of substances hopefully the use of substances for self development and healing will come to the center stage again in the next 10 years lastly there is a very deep and wide area of idol therapy idol worship idol processing this whole idol science and one important area of idol science is idol centered self development and all of these are paths to enlightenment openness inclusiveness pluralism in the definition of enlightenment and paths to enlightenment acceptance of subjectivity acceptance of different states which can be the end states the last states for different individuals and there need not be one objective solution it it creates harmony among all spiritual schools and upanishads much better than argument refutation or demolition or victory by arguments one important element that brahma sutra struggles with is how to deal with statements in upanishads because these statements are made by mystics in their mystical states and by nature these statements are poetic take for example a few examples thank you there is a statement which says he who doesn't know is ignorant or deluded whatever way you translate he who knows is even more deluded or even more ignorant and this is related to enlightenment that he who doesn't know let me just correct it ignorant is much better he who doesn't know is ignorant he who knows is even more ignorant meaning the state of enlightenment is not an ordinary knowledge entity to be known it is something to be realized and if somebody thinks he can cognitively know it he is even more ignorant than somebody who has not even started off in chinese they say tao that is said is not tao and in brahma sutras it does a profoundly good thing by saying first it is neti neti it cannot be described not this not this anything you say the experience of brahma is not that it's not a cognitive experience it's not something that can be easily described in words and yet so it eliminates everything so as to create a state of no thought and take you to the position of brahma from there but later on it also gives a positive description of what brahma is so for reaching there you have to go into constant negation and use statements like this first and second having experienced it you don't abide by this and you do a positive description of it saying 
it cannot be fully described, it cannot be put into words, but it is not that nothing can be said about it. It can be partially described and that partial description is this positive description of Brahma of the state of enlightenment. Now, how do we look at all of this? Yeah, so the statements which are said in the mystical state did not be taken up as literal absolute truths. Statements made in this mystical poetic state, they are they sound good, they are very inspiring, very pleasing, very inviting, very interesting, enigmatic and fascinating, but they need not be true over a large set of contexts. They may be true in very few particular contexts and that context may refer to the state of mind into which the mystic himself is. So true in a few contexts, not applicable in most of the contexts. And therefore, if you stretch it into making it a literal absolute truth over all the contexts, it will not work out. So, we have to respect and yet know the limitation of that mystical poetic statements. We can't make a law out of poetry. For the present and future, How does this help us? One very important element from this discussion is the idea of program of life. That there seems to be a program of life for the universe, for the planet and for the individual. And very important in individual's life is when this happens. Athato Brahma Jignas. And that once this happens, one starts the search, after considerable effort and time, one comes to one's basket of beliefs, one's goal of the enlightenment as he understands or likes it and the path towards it. And there are two experiences one goes through. We have to go through certain experiences according to our karma and self journey before enlightenment can happen. Even if we do everything right, until the karma is exhausted and the experiences necessary according to our soul journey are had, enlightenment does not happen. It might give you a few glimpses. It might give you a short term experience, but it will never be the new normal. So we have to pass through experiences. Experiences are very significant. That is where the significance of the world and the significance of Maya comes in. That the world itself is in an evolution. It's a part of the larger journey of the universe. It is not like the Prakriti is a nuisance. It's not a nuisance. The Prakriti is as important as the Purusha and the Prakriti also is in evolution like the Purusha. And both of them are equal partners in this journey of universe. Post-enlightenment. That is where the relevance of history and the relevance of individual's experience comes in. No matter how banal, how messy, how petty, how ridiculous it may be, it is significant in the flow of the universe. It is through these experiences that the elementals are processed out in the journey of universe. So the macro principles are the journey of the universe, journey of the soul and the law of karma. But at the micro level, elementals are getting processed out in the journey of universe according to the principle. Post-enlightenment, we saw there are two extremes. Some people take a complete withdrawal position of Dud, who don't go even out to preach anybody. At times, they don't even eat 
and they just die to the other extreme of Krishna who is involved in everything without entanglement and in between are various hybrid stations. Avadhut can be an ideal for a few. It cannot be a social ideal. Ideal for our times is Krishna and particularly uh, Guru Gobind Singh who talked about the Sant Sipai, the enlightened person who is also a soldier. Our times where civilization, freedom, goodness is under threat by the communist and jihadi forces. Avadhut cannot be an ideal. Our ideal has to be on the side of Sri Krishna, especially Guru Gobind Singh. How do we look at it from a psychoanalytic standpoint? If we try to do a compare contrast synthesis analysis, rather compare contrast synthesis endeavor, how does it enrich psychoanalysis and Brahma Sutras? From Brahma Sutras, we can take many ideas that can enrich psychoanalysis in the areas of philosophy, the goal of life, plurality of paths of self-development, concept of spiritual crisis that many individuals coming to psychotherapy may have a spiritual crisis only, not a pathological crisis or in some cases both go together you are seeing a pathological crisis and a spiritual crisis together. Stanislav Grof, he talks about a spiritual emergency. That just as there is a biological emergency and a psychological emergency, there is a spiritual emergency. So the idea of spiritual crisis being a part of human life, once factored into the whole therapy structure, provides us far better understanding and management of what is at end. The concept of reincarnation, once accepted, will revolutionize our ideas of constitution and purpose and the reasons for pathology. Just as the idea of fantasy, revolutionize the idea of trauma. The idea of fantasized trauma revolutionize our understanding of trauma. Similarly, the idea of reincarnation also will revolutionize our understanding of the constitution and trauma, which are at the root of pathology and therefore primary in our healing technique, in guiding our healing technique. Bringing of holistic healing tools in spirituality. Some spelling mistakes, just let them go. Development, healing, wrongly spelled. Just let it go. Holistic healing tools found in spirituality can be brought into psychoanalysis both for use by the therapist and also by self-work by the patient. I think this is going to be a big thing in the next 10 years. A flood of tools and techniques from holistic healings and spirituality into psychoanalysis. It will enrich psychoanalysis, all of it. What will spiritual schools or Brahma Sutra or something of that can gain? If we bring in the conceptual knowledge of psychoanalysis, the spiritual schools are enriched. Especially process knowledge of psychoanalysis is very important to understand the deeper levels of spiritual practices. Then psychoanalysis provides actually an intermediate level, layer. So you have the macro process, its ordinary understanding, psychoanalytic understanding, and then uh, elemental understanding. 
So that one layer of psychoanalysis, the one layer which is missing is where psychoanalytic knowledge can help us fill up our understanding of spiritual practices in a micro way. We can bring in empirically and rigorously tested concepts from psychoanalysis into spirituality and then address them using spiritual techniques. The psychoanalytic psychotherapy can help us in the cleaning of the unconscious and spirituality wants to do it in 100 different ways. So one more way can be this. Often you see somebody who has spent a lifetime in spirituality still not aware of and therefore not free of certain infantile elements which can be easily dealt with in psychoanalysis. That can be a great service of psychoanalysis to spiritual evolution of individuals. Spirituality and mysticism at times can be used as a defense against pathology. And if you use psychoanalysis within the spiritual schools, you can get past these defenses and get a deeper healing and a far free and developed individual, far more free and developed individual. And lastly, the techniques and tools of different schools of psychoanalysis, Freudian, Kleinian, Gaussian, basket full of techniques and tools can always be used in spiritual schools for purposes of spiritual goals, especially enlightenment, journey towards it. So both stand to gain from a synthesis. Hope in the next 10 years, 15 years, we see, we see a strong and purposeful synthesis. Thank you.